Hi everybody, good afternoon. My name is Mark Peacock and I am the MD and founder of a business called Pricemaker. And we help companies improve their pricing to deliver profitable growth. This afternoon, I want to talk to you about the psychology of pricing and how it can be used to help you win more sales. Many people think that pricing is purely a rational game and that you have to apply logic and uh, consistent rules to make it work. But if you do that, you're missing out on a whole uh, other world of um, practical and pragmatic ideas and strategies that you can use to help you be more successful in business. And that comes from the world of behavioral economics, and behavioral science, and how to use the uh, psychological pricing techniques uh, that I'm going to share with you today. So I run a business called Pricemaker, and um, these are the uh, topics that we're going to be speaking about this afternoon. We're going to start with a quick look at uh, the question of what is value? How do customers, how do your customers judge the value of what you offer? How do customers then make decisions? What goes on in the brain when we're trying to consider whether or not to buy from you? And then we'll look at a number, a range of different pricing ideas that might be slightly counterintuitive. They might surprise you, uh, but I hope that they will inspire you to think differently about your pricing. So that includes uh, the relativity of pricing, how pricing can be irrational at times, techniques such as price anchors, decoy pricing, an understanding of what loss aversion might mean for how you sell your prices, uh, why we use price bands, and then how to design a range of price choices so that you're presenting your customers with the best possible means of selecting how they can work with you. So let's get this started. So the first question is, what is value? Um, if we want to understand the psychology of pricing, then we need to understand how customers perceive value. So how do we define value in this context? So I like this definition from Tim Smith. It's very simple and it's very clear. And what it says is value equals benefits minus price. In other words, what incremental benefits am I going to get from buying your product or service? And the value I get is the difference between the benefits and the price. So this is quite helpful, actually, because when it comes to thinking about pricing, we now know that there's actually only three things that we need to worry about. Number one, what does the customer value about what we do? Number two, what differentiated benefits can we provide to the customer versus our competitors? And number three, how much do we charge for those benefits so that we del deliver more value to the customer than the price they pay for the product or service. And whether you realize this or not, this is how you are making buying decisions every day. And this is a much better place to start when it comes to thinking about pricing rather than starting with unit costs or what your competitors are charging. And, and as somebody once said, value like beauty is always in the eye of the beholder. So here are my five rules to think about value. Uh, because, of course, the trouble with value is it's quite hard to pin down. And I think many people in business don't really understand the concept of value. Whereas with pricing, it's easy just to set the price for your product, right? Whether it's a new product or you put a price in your annual budget at the start of the year. And you said, right, we've sorted price. It's fixed. It's done. Don't need to worry about it anymore for another year. Um, but as, you, as you'll see, it's never that simple. Right, Life is just not that simple. So here we go. So rule number one, value is a psychological construct. In other words, it exists entirely in the mind of the customer. So if we understand that, then number two also applies. Value 
is entirely subjective and entirely individual. So I might pay uh, £1,000 for a new sofa, but my friend up the road might pay £2,000 because they value it more than I do. It's always subjective and individual to every person's unique preferences and how they judge the value of what you do. Number three, that perception of value is always changing. So if there is a sudden shortage of sofas, for example, and I suddenly start, decide I really want a sofa, I might now be willing to pay £2,000 for it rather than £1,000. Um, so if we fixed our price at the start of the year in a budget, you can see that, that that doesn't make sense for you as a business owner because you'd be missing out on capturing that additional revenue. Uh, rule number four is probably the most important, to be honest. Um, and it says value perception can be shaped and influenced. Now, you will know already that there are many ways to influence perceptions of value. Uh, we can do it with marketing, uh, with branding, uh, with product quality, service delivery, reviews, reputation, and so on. All of these things affect a customer's perception of the value of what you do. But what many people don't realize is that you can also use pricing quite deliberately to subtly influence how they perceive the value of what you do. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, in the rest of the uh, lecture this afternoon. And ultimately, understanding value is the key to better pricing. Once we really understand value, we understand what our customers want and need from us, we can deliver a product or service that um, provides those benefits and do it at a price uh, that the customers think offers a good deal. Because that's what we're interested in at the end of the day. Right? We want a good deal, whether we're buying a one pound loaf of bread or a Rolls Royce. It doesn't matter. The customer always wants a good deal. Now, let's think about how customers, and this applies equally to B2B as to B2C, how do people make decisions? Now, there's an awful lot going on in our brains, right? Uh, apparently, every day we make over 35,000 decisions every single day. So that includes... What shirt am I going to wear today? Do I need to take extra clothes to go outside if it's raining? Have I got enough food for dinner tonight? Now, if you're trying to sell to a senior person in an organization, and let's say you're trying to sell to the C-suite, imagine the amount of stuff that they've got going on in their brain. They've got all sorts of decisions, all sorts of pressures uh, to consider. So it's our job as sellers to make uh, the pricing proposition and make that buying decision for them as easy as possible. Now, there's plenty of levers that we can pull. Of course, we can create a product offering that offers high, high value. We can use our branding and marketing to create awareness of that product. We can design our pricing in line with willingness to pay. We can create choices within our product offering so that we're giving people a fair crack at the whip in terms of how they might choose to engage with us. We can take on board an understanding of how people make decisions. And most people will use a, a mental shortcut known as a heuristic. And, and there's all sorts of biases that are influencing people's, people's ways of making a decision. We can also uh, affect their reference prices, and that's how they judge the value what you want to offer and of course we need to be mindful of what's going on in your competitive environment so there's a lot to consider right so we're going to take a closer look at two of these things the first one is the uh, the biases and the second one is the the pricing tactics that we can use now this slide is very busy um, but i make no apologies for that because i just want you to take on board the idea that there are loads of different ways to think about pricing Here's a slide that says 50 pricing strategies and tactics. Which one is right for your business? Now, I bet you there's one on here you haven't used that could work really well for your business. And it's just a lack of awareness, right? People generally lack awareness about pricing strategies because it's not as visible. 
it's not as well taught uh, in business schools and places like that. But actually, there's nothing on this page that you couldn't understand. It doesn't mean to say it's relevant for your business, but there's nothing on this page that you couldn't understand. So we're going to take a slightly closer look at some of the ideas and strategies uh, listed in the psychological pricing section. So let's have a look at those. The first idea is this idea that price sends a signal to your market about the quality of your product. And it affects the value perception of how customers perceive what we do. It comes from a great book called Predictably Irrational by Dan Reilly, and he's a professor of behavioral studies at MIT in the United States. And he does this lovely experiment where he gives his students aspirin. And he says to one half of the group, the aspirins cost $2. And to the other half, uh, that the aspirin costs 10 cents. Go away and use the aspirin and come back and tell him, Dan, how effective it was at reducing pain. Um, so when they came back, the students who had the $2 aspirin said, 80%, uh, 85% said, yes, it cured my headache. And the students who had the 10 cents aspirin, 60% said, yeah, it cured my headache. But what neither group knew was that in both instances, the aspirin was a placebo. Now, what does that tell you? Well, A, it tells you that placebos cure headaches, first and foremost. But more importantly, for the context of today, the only difference was the price they were told, right? So the students who had the $2 aspirin thought, wow, must be a good aspirin. And the students who had the 10 cents aspirin probably thought, mm, it's a bit cheap, it's probably not very good. Um, and that's affected their perception of the value and their actual experience of the quality of the product. 85% of those who had the $2 aspirin uh, said it cured their headache even though there was no difference with the, um, the 10 cents aspirin, because it was a piece of chalk, it was, an, it was a placebo. So the only difference was the price they were told, and that had a massively powerful effect on their perception of value. And this is a really important lesson in business, because I think too often we underestimate the power of a high price point, and we overuse, <laughs> low prices to try and attract customers but in doing so we send a signal about the quality of our product so we need to be mindful that we're not setting expectations too low the next idea comes uh, from the world of luxury watches so if i asked you how would you sell a two thousand dollar watch most people will probably reply and give me some reasons like, well, we need to demonstrate the quality. We need to uh, show the, the value of the brand. We need to talk about all of its features and so on. Um, and yes, you could do all of those things, um, but you're still having to work hard to sell a $2,000 watch. Um, but there's an old saying in the watch industry, which is that the way to sell a $2,000 watch is to put it next to a $10,000 watch. So here's a uh, Rolex, uh, looks very similar to the one on the left, the tag, uh, but the Rolex is $10,000. So if I was in the market for a quality watch, um, I might now be influenced to appreciate that there are much more expensive options available to me, uh, such as the Rolex, and it looks great, um, but you know what? It's probably a little too expensive for what I need. So in comparison, maybe £2,000 for the tag here, watch is acceptable. And this is the idea or the concept of price anchoring. And we'll come on to what we mean and how we can use price anchoring in a second. But I just want to explore this idea of price relativity a bit more. Now, if I asked you, just to think for a second, which of the two orange circles on the slide is bigger, the one on the left or the one on the right? People might say the one on the right, it clearly looks bigger. But if I was to draw a horizontal line from the top to the bottom of both circles, you'd realize that they're the same size. And of course, this is a famous optical illusion. It's known as the Ebbinghaus illusion. 
And what's happening is that the orange circle on the right looks larger because it's surrounded by smaller gray circles, whereas the one on the left looks smaller because it's surrounded by larger gray circles. And we can take on board this idea, this understanding into our pricing. So if I have a product that's £100 and I put it next to uh, some £500 products, it's going to look small in comparison. If I have a product that's £100 and I put it next to loads of £10 products, it's going to look large or high in comparison. And fundamentally, this is how we are judging value as consumers or customers. And it's the same in B2B or B2C. If the product price is £100 and I'm comparing it to something significantly more expensive, it would look smaller in comparison. Of course, it makes sense, right? There's no great secret to that. But I think the, the trick that people are missing is understanding how to apply and use that in real life. There's another great story um, from the same book I mentioned previously, which is how, how a number can influence another number. So what I mean by that is there's an experiment that's detailed where people in a room are invited to take out their credit card and write down the last two digits of the credit card number sequence. Doesn't matter what they are, just the last two digits. Um, and then secondly, we're now going to invite them to bid on a bottle of wine, you know, a nice classic uh, Chateau Neuf de Pape. How much would you be willing to pay? 30, 40 pounds. And what we find is that the people who wrote down a high sequence of numbers from their credit card, eight, seven, eight, nine, tend to bid a high price for the wine. Whereas those people that wrote down a low sequence of numbers, one, two, three, from their credit card, tend to bid a lower price for the wine. Now, think about that for a second. What has the what have the last two digits of your credit card got to do with the price of a bottle of wine? Absolutely nothing is the answer. Yet, in this exercise, people have been influenced over the price they might be willing to pay for a bottle of wine because they've just previously looked at two numbers uh, and where the numbers were high relative to the product, it's influenced their thoughts on how much they might be willing to pay. So it seems completely irrational, but it happens. And this is how we, this is how we think. This is how we make decisions. If we hear or see a number that's larger than the next number, then it influences our perception of value and potentially our willingness to pay for the product. So let's give an example of how we can use that uh, in real life. So imagine you're a marketing agency and you sell websites for a living. And let's say typically a standard website might cost £2,000. It doesn't really matter what the number is, but let's just say for the sake of argument. So when you go along to meet your prospective clients, you do your pitch, you demonstrate the... Uh, the website solution uh, that you come up with, the creative designs, uh, the look and feel, uh, and then you say, the, and the price is £2,000. And the problem with that, of course, is you're only giving the customer one price, one option. It's a take it or leave it price. And if they like uh, the price, then great. But if they don't like it, what happens? They might go to another competitor, or if they feel they do want to work with you, but they don't like the price, they might try and knock you down and get a, a decent discount. So what you can do to influence your chances of success is to create a high price anchor offer, a high end solution. So if you can create within your product range an alternative premium offer. So in this instance, I've called it a high end website. Um, and price it significantly higher than the standard product, um, you'll be helping to influence the customer by presenting them with a high price anchor first. So let's replay that sales scenario. So now we're going along to the prospective client and saying, hello, Mr. Client, I've got a couple of options to share with you today. 
First, we've got our all singing, all dancing, high end, super duper solution website. And it's got all of these different versions and it's fully branded and it's got loads of integrations and it's going to meet your business needs exactly. And the price for that is £5,000. Now, at that point, you know that the client might think, oh, it's quite expensive. Um, have you got anything else? You know, so, yes, of course. That, our second option is our standard offering. So it does, still does the core things that you need, but it doesn't have all of the extra fancy bells and whistles. And the price for that option is £2,000. So now the buyer has seen, first of all, the £5,000 solution and think, wow, these guys must be good. They can build £5,000 quality websites, price signals quality. But secondly, you've now given them a choice at a much lower price point that might be significantly more affordable and acceptable to them. And in that second scenario, in their minds, they're coming down from £5,000 down to £2,000. Whereas in the first scenario I described, where there's only one price of £2,000, effectively they're going from zero up to £2,000. And we're not influencing their perception of quality with a high price anchor. So a tactic as simple as that can be very effective. It takes a bit of work to create the high-end solution, uh, but it's well worth doing uh, depending on how you can use that in your sales pitch. Here's another example I love uh, because it's completely counterintuitive. Um, so there's this story about the Econ Economist the magazine and their annual subscription price. And they tested two different approaches. So they had ManyWay, which offered three options, online only access for $59, print only access for $125, and then print and online access for $125 per year. And you can see the take up rates on the right there. So 16% bought the cheapest option, nobody bought the middle option, and 84% bought the premium option. So they looked at this and they thought, well, there's no point having that middle option, is there? If nobody's going to buy it, let's just take it off the menu. So they tried another menu, menu B, which now looks like this. Online only access for $59 or print and online access for $125. Now, can you guess what happens to the take up rate when customers are presented with that menu? I'm sure you can. And yes, the answer is that the take up rates completely flip around. So now more people, two thirds are buying the cheapest option and only one third, 32% are buying the most expensive option. So what, why is that? What's going on? Well, in the mind of the buyer, when they look at options sort of menu B, there's two options to think about, right? Online only access for $59. Well, that sounds okay. And print and online for $125. So that's an extra $66 to get a hard copy of the magazine every week. Hmm. Okay, well, I could do that. Uh, and a third of customers choose to buy that option. But for most people, given those two options, most people will choose the cheaper option, the online only access option at $59. Whereas if we go back to many way, when people look at those options, two of them are very similar. So for a few milliseconds longer, the buyer thinks about the options slightly more carefully. And what they think is that, okay, well, there's two options there that are very similar, print only for $125 and print and online for $125. Well, why wouldn't I take print and online for $125? Because I'm effectively getting online access for free, whereas at the top of the menu, it says it costs $59. So that's a no-brainer, right? I'll take print and online at $125. Thank you. And what's happened is that the print only option is what's known as a decoy price. So a decoy is a product and price option that offers worse value than your premium option. In this case, it doesn't include online access. So why would anybody buy it? It doesn't make any sense. Now, this is what I mean by pricing can be counterintuitive. Because if you look at that menu A on the left there, you'd never sit down and design that. 
as a as a price list as a menu option for your business would you it just wouldn't occur to you it just doesn't make sense but it has an impact and what's really interesting in uh, just to finish this slide off is that for every 100 people who were to buy those options on those take up rates the economists would generate $11,000 of revenue and for every 100 people that would uh, by many B on those take up rates, they generate $8,000 of revenue. Now that's a 40% increase in revenue just from changing how the pricing options are presented to the buyer. We haven't increased the prices between many way and many B, we've just changed the presentation of the options. So something as simple as how we present our prices, whether it's on a web screen, in a proposal document on a slide. Something as simple as that can have a profound influence on take up rates and which option buyers are willing to pay for. So incredibly powerful, completely counterintuitive. Here's another great lesson. This comes from Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Now he won a Nobel Prize for this work back in 2012. And what he noticed, or what he talked about, was that how, as people, uh, we experience losses at a greater level than an equivalent gain. So, for example, uh, if we gain, if we lose something, we feel the pain of that loss twice as much as an equivalent gain. Now, imagine you had, uh, imagine you won a hundred pounds, uh, and you. Uh, and if the cash was placed in your wallet or your box, you think, great, it's nice. I can go out for dinner tonight. Uh, but then when you got to the restaurant, you realised you'd lost the cash. You'd, you'd just fallen out of your wallet or purse, or even worse, it had been stolen. Now, you'd feel the pain of that loss, the £100, far greater than the pleasure you got from being given £100. So we experience the psychological pain of a loss twice as much as the gain for the equivalent uh, thing to happen. And I always remember the, the quotes from sports. So Jimmy Connors uh, always used to say, I hate losing more than I enjoy winning. Kevin Keegan, the football manager, used to say, I hate losing 1-0 more than I enjoy winning 1-0. Because it's the same thing, right? The pain of the psychological loss, the psychological pain of the loss is greater than the, uh, the pleasure or gain we feel from uh, the win. What has this got to do with pricing, you might be asking? Well, in uh, general, in business, in marketing uh, and in sales, we tend to quote our cheapest price first, right? We say things like prices from £99, prices from uh, 20 pounds and upwards prices from 500 pounds and up but the problem with that is you're creating a price anchor because that's the first number that the customer hit, sees or hears about your offering and you've set an anchor at the low end of your price range so let's just imagine you've got three products you're trying to sell one is 100 pounds the other is 200 pounds and the third is 500 pounds so if you try and sell that by saying, well, look, our entry product starts at 100 pounds, our mid-range product is 200 pounds, and our premium product is 500 pounds, you're going up in price. And the customer experiences that as a psychological pain because it's costing them more money. So very simply, if you just flip that approach on its head and sell your prices high to low, you can avoid the psychological pain. So now we say, well, our premium option starts at £500. We've also got a mid-range op mid option at £200 and an entry product at £100. They're coming down in price as they listen to that or see that piece of information. So they experience that as a gain. They're gaining a saving in money. So we want to do everything we can, right, to avoid our customers experiencing any of the presentation of our pricing or products as a psychological loss because they feel that loss twice as much as the equivalent gain, even though the numbers are the same. So the implication is sell your prices from high to low where you can. And here's a few neat examples that I've come across. 
So MailChimp, the email marketing software provider, they present their prices from high to low, left to right. You know, most online services that you've seen, you've probably seen the cheapest price on the left and the most expensive price on the right. Uh, but MailChimp has switched it around. So they've clearly tested this a lot, right? So they know by presenting their prices like this, uh, it influences the, more of their customers to pick the £17 product because very few are going to pick the 299 product. So most people will pick the $17 product. But just imagine for a second, if those were shown low to high, so the first number you see is 0, then 11, then 17, then 299, I bet the, the tests have shown that in that scenario, more people pick the $11 uh, option uh, because the first number we see affects uh, our judgment of value and it subtly influences the price we might be willing to pay. It's another great example, a study carried out a few years ago now where they tested the presentation of prices in a, in a pub. So the pub had a menu of beers, um, 13 different beers, and it was normally presented in low to high price order. So the cheapest price is beer is at the top and the most expensive is at the bottom. Um, so they switched that around. They didn't change any of the prices. They didn't change any of the products. They just changed the order in which the prices were presented. So the most expensive beer is now at the top and the cheapest is now at the bottom. And what they found over an eight-week period was that their average sales price increased by 4.1% just from how they changed the presentation of the prices. Now, that's extraordinary, I think. If, um, if the exercise had gone into the pub and just said, put your prices up by 4.1%, what would have happened? Well, demand probably would have dropped because it's just a straight increase on every single price. But you can achieve uh, the same outcome. You can achieve an effective increase in price without actually increasing the prices, but by changing how you present your prices. So the presentation of your pricing is, is so important, and we underestimate how powerful that can be. Now, I'm sure uh, you're all aware of the idea of price bands, dot .99 pricing, 99p, 99 cents whatever it's been, it's very well known, very commonplace, particularly in retail. But what is it and does it work? Why does it work? So it's commonly known as a thing called left digit bias, which means that when we look at a number, uh, we tend to orientate our view of that number to the, the first digit in the number sequence. So if the number is 199, we tend to see the one as the leading indicator of the value of that price. So when we think about prices, we see prices in different price bands. So if we take this, this dress example, and this is based on a study uh, done by MIT. Okay. So if you sell a dress and it's $40, it's in the 40 to 49 price band. If you reduce the price by $1 to 39 pounds, it's now gone down the price band and it's in the 30 to 39 price band. So our perception is, is that the, the value is significantly cheaper than the actual change in price. It's only been reduced by $1, but actually it's moved down a whole price band. So our perception is, oh, that's a much better deal. So yes, it can, and it does work for that reason, because we think in price bands. Yeah, we, we orientate our focus when looking at prices to the left-hand digits. So if your goal as a business is to sell more volume, then this can be a useful tactic. But equally, uh, the, re the reverse is true. If you're selling a very high quality product or a high ticket item, and you don't really care about selling high volume, then you're probably better off rounding up your price to 20 pounds to 40 pounds to 100 pounds because that signals quality as we talked about earlier so you need to be very mindful of the price points uh, that you choose and deliberately select uh, where you're going to sit either side of that threshold uh, because if you go over a certain threshold of course you know uh, the demand can fall off quite significantly so as I've said, there's an awful lot going on in our 
buyer's brains, but there are many ways that we can use to influence their perception of value and help them make better decisions. Not necessarily force them, we don't want anything to be misleading, but just gently nudge them to think about uh, an option that might be more uh, relevant to them. And the key is really to make your pricing as easy as possible for your customers. And one of the uh, one of the key lessons I like to talk about is how that in every market, your market, my market, every single market in the world, there are always different levels of willingness to pay. WTP means willingness to pay. So we've got a low segment, a medium segment, and a high segment. So those customers or prospects who are in the low willingness to pay segment either don't have enough money to buy what you're offering, or they do, but they don't see the value in it. Whereas at the other end of the scale, those customers in the high willingness to pay segment probably do have enough money, but also they value things other than price. They value things like product quality, brand, reputation, service, whatever it is that makes your product stand out. So they're willing to pay more for a better version. And then you've got the, the majority of the market who sit in the middle. And what we tend to think as business owners, business leaders, is that everybody is in this low willingness to pay segment. So we tend to gravitate our prices towards the low end of the scale. But in doing so, we miss out on capturing revenue from people who might be willing to pay more. So the simple way around that is to create options, um, an entry, a standard and a premium offering so that you can offer a relevant choice at a relevant price to each of the customer segments in your market. Even better, within each segment, you can offer three options. So for all of the high willingness to pay customers within their price range, you, you offer them three options. All of the low willingness to pay customers, you offer them three options and so on. So you're always giving choice and you're always providing the buyer with a range of carefully designed options that um, you think they're going to be willing to pay for. Now, we see this a lot in particularly online and digital pricing. This is the pricing for promo.com, and they offer video marketing services for small businesses. And what's interesting here, and this is a, an important characteristic of this approach, is that there's a bigger gap in price between their pro, their premium offer, 279, and the standard offer of 79. There's a 200 pound difference in price there than between their basic product and their standard product. There's only a 40 pound difference. So 39 to 79 is 40 pounds. But 79 to 279, of course, is a 200 pound difference. And this is critical. So you need a bigger gap in your price differences between your standard and premium offer than between your standard and entry offer. And the reason is it creates a high price anchor for the premium option. So we want people to see a high price anchor for that premium option, because as I've explained, that will do wonders in terms of influencing their expectation of quality and value. And it will shift up their willingness to pay for your product or service. And in so doing, when we present three options like this, what do we find? We find that more people will be willing to pick the middle option because probably that's the best combination of price and value to meet their needs. They can't afford the most expensive one. They don't want the cheapest one because maybe it's not quite what they need. So um, as, a, as a risk averse option, I'm gonna pick the middle, uh, the middle product, the 79 pounds uh, product. Um, and you can do this, you can take this approach for any business. You can do it for online businesses. You can do it for consulting and advisory businesses. If you present option A, option B, option C, you can do it if you're a product manufacturer. Again, you, you're constantly trying to offer your prospect or your customer three options of well-spaced out uh, prices um, and products and you let them choose right so it's not a hard sale uh, task you say here are our offerings you choose mr customer which option best meets your needs at a price you're willing to pay and in doing so it actually becomes easier to sell 
more premium prices uh, than if we were just to go in and put your prices up by 5%. It's far easier. And you'd be amazed at the number of people I've shown this technique to. And they come back to me afterwards as, and they say, Mark, the client chose the premium option. Yet they would never have dared to present that high level price to them before because they just thought they'll never buy at that price. But if you give the customer choice, they are more likely to buy. So it's an easy way to sell higher prices. And also, of course, by offering choice, you should sell more overall as well. So you achieve a higher sales rate at a higher price. That's why I call it the ultimate pricing strategy, tiered pricing. So to summarize, let's just recap on the things that we've covered today. So firstly, price signals quality. So be very careful about where you position yourself in the market. Try and avoid showing too many low price points and do whatever you can to include some high price points because it sends a strong signal to your buyers about the quality of what you do. Number two, use price anchors to influence customer expectations about the, the value they're going to get. And it subtly encourages them uh, to think about, wow, that's a good deal. You know, think about the, the Rolex watch example that I mentioned. Change the framework, uh, change how you present your prices to your customers. You remember the economist example with the decoy price? Without increasing the actual price for the subscription, they could generate 40% more revenue in a year uh, just by changing how the information on pricing is presented to the customer. Uh, number four, where you can, if you can, it doesn't always work, but where you can, sell your prices from high to low so that your buyers are avoiding psychological pain uh, when, they, when they hear your prices. Uh, number five, offer a choice of price points because that will increase your conversion and help you sell. That's a high average selling price. And then you remember the slide from earlier, the 50 pricing strategies. There's plenty to choose from, right? So make sure you apply thought and effort to differentiating your pricing. And don't just follow what everybody else does in your market. And, and ultimately, we want to be designing our prices in line with how our customers are thinking about value. You know, remember the 35,000 decisions they've got going on in their heads every day. So design in line with value and tiered pricing is one of the easiest and most effective ways to do that. So thank you for your time today. If you're interested to know more, you can find out uh, more in my book, which is called Pricing for Success, which contains everything that I've talked about today, plus my seven step framework for uh, creating a better pricing strategy. It's available on Amazon and all other good online retail sites. And with that, I leave you with my contact details. If you'd like some help with your pricing strategy, please feel free to get in touch and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for your time today.